All right. Uh, well, it's a, a wonderful pleasure uh, to, have, uh, to have organized this morning's program. As you see, um, the, the last names of all the presenters are the same, and there's a good reason for that because it was the vision of the Salzmans that, uh, and a phone call from Manny that really uh, sparked Telluride to happen. And as a, I think uh, I was kind of surprised to learn they were only thinking of coming for one year, but I guess it makes a lot of sense. They were traveling around, and then to find out that uh, they stayed because uh, we liked them so much, and they liked us so much, and the mushrooms were so good. Um, this year certainly has been a great mushroom year, and it kind of proves that this is a good, good place for a mushroom festival. Um, Jason Salzman, uh, I've watched Jason grow up from a, a young little boy to a very impressive uh, man and a family man. Uh, when he was at Brown University, he managed to make national headlines. Um, in, in Denver, he's been a force for the community in many, many ways. Uh, not least of all was uh, watching the uh, television uh, programming and, and pointing out just how little real news occurs on television. Um, and he's done great work there. He's, he's written books about helping uh, nonprofits in, in their work. And he's really a renaissance man in many ways. And he's also a great mushroomer. So please welcome Jason Salzman. Very much art. Yeah, even if there were no mushrooms in Telluride, we would have stayed. <laughs> mushrooms had nothing to do with it. And people who've been to these mushroom festivals over the years know that mushrooms really are irrelevant to the to the core uh, of the festivals. So I'm going to just talk today about urban mushrooms, since this is such a beautiful urban environment up here in Telluride. And I'll just get right into it. Uh, so. When you think of an urban garden, you generally might think of something like this, a, uh, a vegetable garden. It's got you know, eggplant, kale, amaranth, uh, cucumbers, there's pumpkin in there. But as, you, as your mind starts to transform and you become a, an urban mushroom hunter, you don't care about anything in the garden. And these gardens, these urban vegetable gardens, become uh, irrelevant to you. What you really look, when you, when you see a garden like that, you think about mushrooms. And in this garden, so you'll ignore all those other things, you, you'll stop caring about them, and you'll focus right in on the corn, which grows this thing called the corn smut mushroom, which is known as wheat licoche in Mexico. Uh, it's very mild, dark, very dark black mushroom that grows, it, it, it infests it, the, co the corn plant takes over an ear of corn like that and makes that beautiful fungus there. So that will be your focus as you become an, an urban mushroom hunter uh, when you're looking at a vegetable garden. There's another shot of it. Uh, it's really, f if they actually, you can buy it canned in Mexican markets or online, like you can buy anything else if you're real curious. And it's a, it's a great experience to try that mushroom. Wheat licoche, the corn smut mushroom. So, you know, that, as you start to get more interested in the, the urban mushroom experience, you're going to find that they pop up everywhere you go in the city. And the whole, your, your life will become a mushroom hunt in the city. Life is a mushroom hunt for you, and you'll find as you uh, move ahead with your life that they're, they're everywhere. This is in our path, our walkway to our home in Denver. Ordinarily, we, you might not even notice that in your yard, right? <laughs> But there it is. It's uh, Phallus impudicus. Uh, what happens with this wonderful mushroom is the flies attack the mucus on the top of the mushroom head there. And th that contains the spores, and the, the, the flies disperse the floors and the, the spores. And they're attracted to, to that mucus because it smells so much, it smells very strongly of uh, semen which is appropriate given its, its looks. The mushroom is edible. In fact, in China, phallus, the phallus genus is eaten widely. In our country, not so much, uh, given the mycophobic nature of America. In a you know, place that's not so mycophobic, people will be eating this all the time, as you, can, as you might expect. But anyway, the part that's edible, the stage is edible is when it's in the ball there, and you, cut, you can cut that up into slices and fry it, as we did last year. And it's a, it's a real experience to eat. Highly recommended. But you make sure that the balls are still hard before you cut them up, because if they're squishy, they're, the smell comes through, and that makes the eating uh, experience a little bit less desirable. 
This is a dog penis mushroom, which also is very common in most cities. You know, an interesting and great aspect to urban mushroom hunting is that these mushrooms grow in urban areas and lawns and in the, around the world. Like, you know, uh, the fungophile group that started the Terry Mushroom Festival has led tours around the world, and in many of the countries that they visited, they found, and I've been on many of the trips, some of these same mushrooms growing. Uh, and this is a dog penis mushroom, which, you know, if you look for it, probably goes around the world too, although I don't know that for sure. So again, you know, you're, the usual urban or person who lives in a city might be focused on gardens and flowers, but as this sort of takes over your life, you don't care about flowers anymore. Well, you care when you look at that flower bed or any other flower bed, you're thinking, What's, what mushrooms are there? And in this case, we found this atharella. It's an edible, very flimsy mushroom with a, this is a nice example of a, of a, a, a trait for a mushroom. It's got a hollow stem, and you can see there on the left, the hollow uh, has broken through. It's, a, you know, it's not a great mushroom to eat. In fact, I've never eaten it, but as you become more interested, you don't care. All you want to do is find mushrooms in the city. So you're bicycling. These are, this is Manny and Joanne, my parents. I, and I promised my father I'd come to this lecture, his lecture this morning, if he came to mine, he agreed. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, you're, you get distracted. You might be starting to get late to work. You can only screw up your life unless you, unless you put a check on it, because mushrooms grow all over the city. It's just like in the forest. That's a great thing about mushroom hunting is when you learn a little bit about it, it enhances your whole experience in the mountains, because, hey, there's all these mushrooms suddenly that were never there before, right? And there they are, and they're so beautiful. The same happens in the city. They're all over the place. They're, those ones that we found uh, on bikes in the grass, many of, many of the mushrooms that grow in the grass grow every, in, in all urban areas in grass. This is an agaricus campestris, which is related to the mushroom that you find in the store, the common button mushroom. Um, it's got characters that you know, distinguish it from that button mushroom in the store. By the way, the button mushroom is exactly the same as the portobello and the cremini. That's all the same mushroom, just grown in different uh, conditions. Anyway, so this one is a, is a very, you know, you see the, this, the ring there is light, it has an inrolled cap, nice smelling mushroom, kind of silky on top. And this is actually a different one, it looks very similar. Uh, it's got a bigger ring and stains when you cut it. So these are different types of agaricus that grow in the city. And this is a third one, which is actually poisonous, the first two are edible. So it's not always so easy to distinguish these, but once you get going at it, you can do it. I recommend, like with mountain mushroom honey, you know, you learn one or two a year and build your knowledge. Don't overwhelm yourself with, with trying to distinguish these different mushrooms. This particular one has a yellow base when you cut it. It's called uh, uh, Agaricus xanthodermis. And at the base, it turns yellow, and it is allegedly poisonous. Although some of the mushrooms that you hear about that are claimed to be poisonous really aren't, so, you know, you have to ask around. Again, this guy, he's supposed to be at work, and look what happened to him. <laughs> and then, you know, around the city, there's, there's rivers, and it's a very it's a fun way to get out uh, on your lunch break, whatever. This is Tom Taggart, a member of the Colorado Mushrooms uh, Club. He's found some cap Caprinus comatus, which is a delicious edible, great for soups, wonderful snack, great hors d'oeuvre you find on your way home. It's another beauty of mushroom hunting in the city. You're on your way home, you need an hors d'oeuvre for dinner, there it is. There's a friend of ours holding one. There's a friend of Telluride, Marty, in the parade with one. And there's, we saw that in the, we just saw that in that preliminary <laughs> video. It was great, that was fun. So it does, and this, this is what's really beautiful. It doesn't just be, this is not an outdoor experience in the city, so even like in the winter, if you're really hard up for mushrooms, Check out your bathroom. This is Pisiza domiciliana, the green, I used to work for the organization Greenpeace, and it didn't, you know, the bathrooms weren't clean that much, which is something you can justify not doing if you're an urban mushroom. Right? Keep those bathrooms dirty, let the, let the toilet overflow, and get along the carpet, because this mushroom is particularly fond of carpet, Pisiza domiciliana, and in fact, it's edible. So if you uh, can get, this is a little bit past over the hill, as they say, but uh, I would go for that and try that. You know, cleaning is just a big waste of time. If you add up your life, 
The amount of time you spend on cleaning is crazy. This is the, and in your plants too. People, I was just looking online, you know, people get really upset because they have this beautiful mushroom, Leuco caprinus burnbamii in their, in their house plants, but embrace it. That's what an urban mushroom hunter does. This is a, a really bad picture of it, but it's got a yellow tinge, very distinct uh, gills, and it's, it's a wonderful mushroom to, to look at. I, I bet it's edible too, but might not be. So uh, again, these are such beautiful mushrooms. This is a velvet foot, uh, Flamulina volutipes, that grows uh, commonly in the city. It's called the winter mushroom because it grows when it's really cold. In fact, in the snow, like I found this literally growing out of snow in Denver. It's got a very velvety uh, stem, looking stem on wood, white spores. This, the cap has an umbo, which is a little sort of knob on the top of a mushroom cap, and it can be very slimy like this. Now contrast that really brown thing that we saw two slides ago to this enoki mushroom, which is the name of it in Japan. On the left side of the slide, that's the same mushroom grown in a, in a cultivated environment. So a completely different looking thing, but the same mushroom, kind of cool. This is uh, Caprinus plicatilis. This is, so you're out there in the grass, I mean, you're gonna find yourself crawling around in the grass because some of these mushrooms, and, you're, and early too, if you're a late person who doesn't get out of bed until you know, late, too late, when you start becoming a mushroom hunter, you're gonna to wanna to get out there early because these will be you know, dried up and gone by eight o'clock. So you'll find yourself getting up at six o'clock, crawling through the grass, finding Caprinus plicatilis. It's a beautiful mushroom and, and you know, it will make your day. It will send you off you know, in a better mood. There it is again. Uh, Japanese parasol, I think it's called. It's really a, a special thing to see. Also in the grass, when you're on your knees, you'll find Conosophy lactea, the cone mushroom. Fine mushroom to find. And if you find 25 or more of this, uh, you will have an opportunity to have a psychoactive experience. This is Penelis fenisecki, reputedly, Allegedly, and I've never found, I, never, I found 25, but I never tried it. Although I have talked to someone who took 25 and said he did not experience any psychoactive effects, which means you might have to double your dose and go to 50. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would start at 50 and go down. Uh, this is uh, Penelius Fenisecki. It's easy to identify and very common in urban lawns. Another shot of it. It's got a white gill edge. Gills can look different as you see them from above. That's got a white gill edge. <clears throat> this is one, Genopolis, it is an, uh, on the subject of psychoactive mushrooms. It grows sometimes in urban areas. It grew, Gary Linkoff found it and ate it in City Park in New York City, and uh, Central Park. And he can tell you about that experience if you want at some point. He's available to talk about his experience on Genopolis in Central Park. <laughs> You know, there are plenty, excuse me? Just not on the stage. Not on the stage, I get uh, There are lots of urban psychedelics that grow in jars in people's basements in the city, and so those are a little harder to find. But there are, you can find those too, and also, you know, on the street. Did you find that one? I, that was a, a, the same family, the same genus, Genopolis. It was found in Telluride. It, that was not Genopolis spectabula, if it's still called that, which is... One, uh, one of Genopolis that I know that's psycho psychoactive, but there probably are others, or maybe they're not. Gary's available to discuss that. <laughs> this is a fleshy mushroom that causes the most cases of mushroom poisoning in America, probably in the world, I don't know, but it's called chlorophyll and molybdites, or it used to be called that. Its common name is the vomiter. And the reason it's called the vomiter is because it, it induces serious, intense, acute gastrointestinal distress, which will put you in the bathroom with the Pisizodoma ciliana, which is a side benefit of that experience for many out. Um, and it's really, a, it tastes, allegedly it tastes really good, which is a problem because people eat more and more until the poisoning effect hits. So you want to be careful of that. It's green spored, it's got a free gills, and it looks kind of like those agaricus, those other white mushrooms I was talking about. Um, so, you know, it's good, like all introductory, or when you get into mushrooms, you should do, start with people that 
you know, know what they're doing. Um, this one, uh, it, it, it's partially, the reason why it is probably the most common cause of mushroom poisoning is because it does look so good. Whereas the deadly mushroom here in Colorado, the Galerina, as people probably have said, it grows on wood, it's brown, nobody would ever really want to eat it, so it, ver it therefore has never caused a, a case of death in Colorado. Um, but this one, because it's in the urban areas and so pretty and it's fleshy, does cause many cases of m a mushroom poisoning. It's got many attributes that are very easy, though, for the mushroom hunter to distinguish it from other mushrooms. The green spores, if you make a spore print, the stain, um, among others. But it still, it does look a little bit, or some, uh, to the untrained eye, very much like uh, other mushrooms that you see. This is one of them called Lepiota or Macro Lepiota ricotis. Names probably changed, but it's a good eating mushroom, which also stains, but differently. It's got a much more uh, acute, or you can see, uh, you know, markings on the cap, uh, and the, 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 the stem is different. It's got a different ring. So it, there are many different ways. There are lots of different ways to distinguish it. But as with all mushrooms you're eating, you're, you're, what you really need to know is the lookalikes. What mushrooms look like the ones you're eating, and you're, once you're sure it's not those in your area, then that's your step toward being able to eat that mushroom. And this one is edible and good. There it is again, and again. This is a uh, caprinus, or inky cap mushroom. These are the ones that over time will turn that what's called deliquesce. They turn to a inky sort of morass. It looks like ink. That's inky cap. This is. Caprinus atrimentarius, which is edible unless you have it with alcohol, allegedly. Um, so if you eat this mushroom and, and have a drink, then you are inclined or you can get sick. So one time, Manny, who first, like with all things mushroom, he introduced me to mushrooms, he introduced me to city mushrooms. He has a, still has a very intense interest in them, but he used to collect them on his way home from work on his bike. And he was... Uh, <clears throat> picking them in one yard, and a man came out and said, don't pick those mushrooms, they're my mushrooms. I was going to eat those mushrooms. And, and Manny said, uh, oh, I think I, got this, I think I got this story wrong. Uh, he said, uh, oh, that's, or he, he, the guy, in any case, the guy wasn't very nice about it. You know, he wasn't like, he, he, he wasn't very offered, you know, he was in the spirit of the mushroom community. He didn't say, well, why don't you take a few for your hors d'oeuvre and leave some for me? But he did. So Manny brought him up to them, brought, picked some, brought him up to him at the door, and the guy was standing there with a drink in his hand. <laughs> and he said, here, take the mushrooms. So, <laughs> that, there's a better punchline there, but that's the gist of it. There's another shot of it. This is a related one, also a caprinus, an inky cap. And it's called Caprinus micaceus. It's got those mic little microparticles, particles, which are really beautiful there on the cap. Caprinus micaceus. It's edible even with alcohol. There's a sort of uh, you know, uh, examples of the different life cycle of a mushroom, starting when it's young and getting older and more black. Another Caprinus disseminatus is a common urban Caprinus, also in the inky cap family. Beautiful little delicate Caprinus. Puffballs also grow in the city. These are a nice treat, uh, not the best, but you know, even bad tasting mushrooms taste good when you pick them in the city. Uh, unless, <laughs> unless you know that the lawn has been had too much pesticides or stuff on it, anyway, which is a concern. I generally don't eat mushrooms that are next to big highways. And I do try to determine, uh, you know, look at, look at lawns that have more weeds and try to pick mushrooms that are less you know, likely to have been pe uh, doused with pesticides. So. You, you have to judge that for yourself. I'm not as worried as some people are about that. In any case, here's puffballs. They, the same rules apply to them in the city as elsewhere. If they're white inside, they're edible. If they're not, uh, then don't eat them. They, if they're already turning brown or black and are in the puffing stage. And then you also want to make sure that they don't have an outline of a mushroom that's emerging from there, which could mean that it's actually not a puffball at all, but a mushroom that's sort of um, button stage. There's an example of a, a puffball that's cut Lengthwise, it is uh, not edible at this point because it's past its white stage. The big giant ones that we found a few days ago, that's my kids there, uh, are not found in the city, unfortunately. You have to come to Telluride and the mountains to find the big, big uh, uh, 
soccer ball size one. But they make people excited. This is my wife, Powerpuff, Powerpuff Ball Girl, yesterday. Just yesterday. Not pregnant, Puffball. <laughs> this is one of the best mushrooms that grow in the city. It's uh, the fairy ring mushroom. It's got a wiry stem with an umbo on top. Uh, it's the, a delicious mushroom. The French are, uh, like it. Great, great little understated mushroom. What's the Latin name on it? It is... Uh, is that one? That is uh, Merasmus Oriades. There we go. Merasmus Oriades. Thank you, Bill. See, I've just forgotten the Latin names. I go with the common ones now because they change so much. No, I, I actually do try to follow them to the degree I can. This is a Lentinus, Lentinus idotes, I believe. It grows on wood. It, this is called the train wrecker because in the old days it would grow on uh, wood railroad ties and, and rot them and cause train. Rex grows in the urban areas still. That's my son grabbing it one year, many years ago. It's got a sawtooth-like uh, appearance on the underside of the gill. Not a great slide, but kind of interesting. Also grows, a, a very common in the city is, and a nice edible is the oyster mushroom, Chlorotus ostriatus, uh, on wood, white gills, shelf-like. The patty straw mushroom, a variation of it, Vulvariella, on, on wood, common in the city. You find that in, in Chinese restaurants and called the patty straw mushroom. Now, the trouble, you know, it's not all fun and games when you're in the city picking mushrooms. There's, there's, there's problems. There's people that normally you would like or, you know, be inclined to not dislike that become your enemies. This guy, he looks really nice. You know, normally this is normal guys out, you know, mowing his lawn, but you really start to hate these people. <laughs> and there's a number of enemies that you're going to cultivate as time goes on, because this is what happens, this destruction from the lawn mowers. And then you just can't, it's hard to look at that and experience that and not start to hate the lawn mower people. <laughs> so he's, he's your first enemy and, and a serious one. Look at that. That's kind of destruction that you see, and it's common. And people need to do something about it. You know, I think that over time, as this catches on, there's going to be a, re a revolution, a rebellion against the lawn mowing establishment. Another enemy, and it's already an enemy in many cases, is the just overall development. This area here, we used to collect bags of beautiful uh, agaricas. And, then this enemy rolled in, brought out the heavy artillery, and look what happened. It's just really sad, and it can really ruin your day, so there are, like I say, there's downfalls. And then a lot of people in America like pets, like this, like the people like dogs. <laughs> but the, when you're out there, they become your enemy really fast. First of all, you can't see them, but there are delicious mushrooms back in the shadowy part of that picture. And you can't get to it because of, of your enemy. So that's definitely, and then they eat them straight up, I swear to God. Those animals will eat mushrooms, and it is such a waste. <laughs> and then you see signs like this, they're all over, really distressing. It's very stressful. And then, not only that, as people who know they have dogs, look what they do to the grass. That area where, the, where the, you know, those dogs are used to be really clean, nice grass that produced Caprinus and other stuff, and they just wrecked it. And then this. <laughs> it's just such a drag. <laughs> You're walking around and just, you don't want to deal with that, I tell you. So overall, dogs are a big enemy for you. And so are gardeners, you know, like, you, you, gardening is this peaceful, you know, new agey thing, and oh. That area there, used to have a really nice collection of agaricus, and he's transformed it into a garden. And he's probably not going to grow corn, so there's no chance of the corn smut mushroom, because he's going to put in flowers. And then just people in general, they'll come after you. And then other people pick them, you know, that's a problem. You, you, can, you know, there's just like in the Pacific Northwest, where people are shooting themselves over Matsutake, you know, eventually it's going to happen in the city because it's such a fun thing to do, it's going to catch on people are going to fight inevitably. 
And there's, you know, a lot of people in microphobic America just can't stand mushrooms. And this is something in the city where there's a concentration of homo sapiens and people, it just it becomes very obvious and prevalent when you see it. And it really pisses you off. This woman, she's after them. <laughs> so you're, you're, it's you against the microphobic culture. It's, it, 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 it puts you in that position in a way in the urban environment that you don't have in the mountains. It's nothing like it. It's just, and it makes you cry. <laughs> it's just bad. At the end of the day, the destruction. <laughs> and then there's the police generally, because you're going to trespass. You're going to want to get into people's yards where you shouldn't be. You're going you're to jump fences. And you're going to tangle with the law. It's just not good. <laughs> so what you might do if it stresses you out too much is just skip the whole experience and go to the markets, because the urban markets have great mushrooms. You don't have to deal with dogs, cat, you know, cats, police, gardeners, anybody, just walk into a market. The Asian markets are particularly good. There's the patty straw mushroom that you might or might not find. It's much more reliably collected in the markets than it is in the, in the city. You can get it out of a can. It doesn't taste that great, but so what? You're not going to be bit by a dog or stuffing dog poop or anything. But, you know, there are definitely good ones you can find in the, in the markets. This is, this is, and, and, and also in the markets, it's nicely laid out. You don't get lost. You know, down this aisle, you find uh, that one. And then oysters, you know, it doesn't matter if it's been raining or not. Shiitake. And then if you just head to the, to, the, to the gourmet markets, you're in heaven because you got pretty much the most delicious edible mushrooms in the world. Morels there, a whole array, right? In an urban area of different kinds of mushrooms for you to pick. And then, you know, forget all other mushrooms truffle, that particular truffle carries the day. Or you could just skip it again completely. Don't have to cook, don't have to deal with the enemies, don't have to figure out which mushrooms are which, and just go to a, a restaurant. There's lots of restaurants in the city, many of them, especially nowadays, are serving delicious mushrooms. You can skip the whole experience and just have a nice lunch or dinner and forget it. You can even eat it outside feel like you're the kind of person that wants some air. <laughs> and that is it. Okay. I don't know if there's time for questions. Do we have any more? Is there one? Yeah, I'm Got one. Yeah. Is there any uh, special consideration? Wait a second. Wait. Oh. 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 Sorry. Are there any uh, general rules of thumb for concerns about uh, toxins that you find in urban environments, either air or soil pollutants in certain species that um, people should think about? Yeah, there are concerns for sure. Mushrooms. Uh, concentrate heavy metals like lead, which you know when, when there was lead, gasoline was a, emitted and is, pro, is undoubtedly present along traveled roadways. That's a concern in the mountains too. So I, like I said, I try not to collect the mushrooms along heavy, heavily trafficked roadways. Um, and I also, if it's obvious that there's been pesticide sprayed or if the lawn looks too immaculate, and usually mushrooms don't grow immaculate. Heavily pesticide or fungicided lawns, anyway, but I try to avoid those. Some people won't do it at all because of the because of the toxins in the urban environment, frankly. So it's kind of a personal choice. Uh, I wash them generally. So, by the way, before I forget, I do want to say that the, the enemies that I, I I expanded on that, but the, that notion was developed by Manny Salzman as well. He developed it as he was confronting these enemies when he was commuting and mushroom hunting over the years, so that the enemy concept goes to, to Manny. <laughs> but I augmented it a little. I have another question. OK. I have a neighbor who has a cornucopia of edible mushrooms in their yard, big yard, inky caps, stink horns. Now they have a bunch of parasols. What are the different parasols? Do you know any? Are they all edible? or? Well, you got to make sure that they are, with parasols, you have to make sure they are indeed parasols. 
um, like they, they're not that vomit or one I was talking about. It can look like them, especially at its younger stage. Uh, the one that I know is this one, that I think it's now called chlorophyllum ricotis, was macro lepiota ricotis or lepiota ricotis. And I don't know the, you know, para, the thing about a common name is you don't really know what it's referring to, like parasol. You know, that, that could refer, the nice thing about a common name is you don't have to remember the Latin names and you kind of know it in your area. But when, it's, when you talk about it like that, I don't know what group you're talking about necessarily. Like I know I'll, if it's all lepiotas, the lepiota ricotis, yeah, I think if it's, if, it's the, if it's the same parasol that I'm talking about with that Latin name, they're all edible, lepiota ricotis. But there might be another lepio, there might be another parasol. Again, Gary's here and is waiting for that kind of question, I hope. Or maybe you can answer it right now. Same answer, different answer. <laughs> the chlorophyllum looks like a parasol. Right. And, that's, and it has very white gills when it's young. So if you don't have a mature mushroom or you don't make a spore print, it's easily mistaken. Right. And then you've got a problem. That's it. Right. So if you've got the parasol, you're okay. But if it's not the parasol, you're not. <laughs> uh, Jason, a person that I know uh, every year calls me up about this time and says, I've got these horrible snake horns in my yard. They've been coming up every year. I want to get rid of them. Um, what advice should I give this person? <laughs> Tell him he's part of the dominant mycophobic culture which needs to be overthrown and replaced by the mycophilic culture and tell your eye. But you know, you do find that. People hate, especially those. I mean, there's something about the shape or the smell or something. People don't like it. It's stupid. It's just insane. It's irrational. <laughs> And I have eaten them, and you can eat them. They're good. I was just going to uh, mention, in my front yard, I also have a bunch of sink horns, but I kind of rely on them to help hold the moisture around my plants because they colonize all of the wood chips there in my front beds. So being in Denver, you might mention to the people that ask you, how do I get rid of them? You might point out that it's kind of holding on to moisture and keeping it so they don't have to use a bunch of water in our yard. That's a, that's a great point. Speaking of which, Paul Stamets tells a story of how a psilocybe mushroom was in, inundating the wood chips in front of the police station in Seattle. <laughs> and the, the, the hippies used to go and pick it at the police station. Walk away. Uh, Jason, thanks really for this talk. Uh, I started urban mushroom hunting last year. Uh, I'd go up into the mountains and there was like nothing going on. And, uh, these little curios started coming up uh, around in my neighborhood. And I thought, well, what the hell? At least I can pick them around here. And I went uh, back to a little neighborhood park beginning of July after a really heavy rain. I was looking for a, I don't, I don't know the Latin name, but the shaggy mane. Right. It had been there the year before. And it wasn't. There wasn't the parasol that was there. Uh, but I started seeing these LBMs and what the hell, you know, let's... Let's uh, try to identify it. So uh, it turns out it was the uh, Paneolius uh, Phonoseki, thank you. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at my guide, Gary's uh, guidebook. Thank you, Gary, for the guidebooks and, uh, and the talks. Uh, but, uh, and I decided to try to eat them. And, and yeah, they're, they're curious. Uh, I'd say you don't have to go to 25, and, I mean, unless you want to do the sort of uh -huh. Visionary urban mushroom quest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but one of the gentlemen here at the uh, conference uh, said, well, in California, we've tested them, and uh, there's nothing in them. Uh -huh. There's nothing in them. And uh, I'd like to say, well, in Colorado, there's something in them. <laughs> and uh, they're really tasty and wonderful. Uh, my question to you is, have you, have you heard of anybody doing any kind of mushroom gardening? Um, whereby they're introducing, um, and do you know if it's done in any kind of formal settings? Yeah, the, yeah. First, the first point that he raised, which is great, is that the, the urban garden, I mean, the, the city is a real urban garden for mushrooms insofar as it's heavily irrigated, and there are consistently mushrooms in the city. So your frustrations of rain are, 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 you know, can be mitigated by that, which is a great point, a great attribute of urban gardening. I mean, urban mushroom hunting. 
uh, in terms of uh, you, you can I I don't know anyone who's actually created. I'm sure it's been done. I don't know off the top of my head. An urban you know a, a, a created an urban mushroom garden to all mushrooms, except people just cultivate mushrooms in their backyard. They could call it that. In other words, you can cultivate certain species, and you can get and it's it's quite easily done outside, even in Colorado, with oysters and certain species. Uh, you get the spawn, the spawn, and the materials from places like Fungi Perfecti. I've grown oysters. I found you know an old cottonwood log, inoculated the oysters with plugs I get from Paul Stamets' company, and water it and grow oysters in a few a year or so, most of the time, <laughs> or sometimes. So uh, that's fun and and very doable. And I think depending on where you are in the country, it's probably you know you can do, cultivate different numbers of species outdoors and not have to bring them in or you know that kind of thing. So I haven't done a lot of that, but it's a, definitely something you can do. So I'm pretty interested in bioremediation that, uh, like Paul Stamets has, has talked about. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, you know, urban pollution, how mushrooms can help us to clean up that mess. Yeah, I think mushrooms can save the world. And included in that is the urban, you know, pr problems of pollution, oil pollution, that kind of thing. So, I don't know, you know, what, how to. I would start with that personally, but I, you know, the folks at Fungi Perfecti again out there might have some ideas. If there's a specific problem you've got, you know, in terms of a, pollute, a polluted area, uh, so uh, I, I think it could be done, but I don't know the details on that. Okay, so uh, I'm around if anything comes to mind, and uh, good luck. <laughs>